Do you think women are satisfied with the kind of men they're getting? Yeah. I mean, I think that's a whole other problem. Women are obviously very attracted and drawn to men who are confident. And, you know, men have been undermined, not just with their, you know, bathroom shelf products, but also just psychologically in terms of not really knowing how to be men, not being really launched into manhood by their their fathers. You know, the, there's just this incredible amount of young men and even older men, I know plenty of them who are, you know, seeming, you can look at them and still say, you know, you might be 60, 65 years old, but psychologically, I think you're still about 15. Well, it is my pleasure to have with me on Ideas Have Consequences, Carrie Gress. Uh, Carrie is the author of this superb uh, a book right here, The End of Woman. How Smashing the Patriarchy Has Destroyed Us. Glad to have you with us, Carrie. Thanks so much for having me. It's great to be here. Well, I'm sorry we couldn't do it in studio, but uh, as I recollect, you were coming, but then you forgot and you went to the beach. That's exactly um, what happened. Exactly what that's, happened. That's, that's my it's recollection of what happened. I had to go, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> the subtitle to this book actually intrigues me because... It's not how feminism has destroyed women. It's how smashing the patriarchy has destroyed yeah. women. Uh, is yeah. that, are you just saying the same thing from the other side, or is there a slight distinction that you're trying to make there? Yeah, well, I think the, the key issue is just to really recognize how when you pit the sexes against one another, you're, you're not, no one's going to come out a winner. Um, and I, I think this is... Going with that subtitle, in fact, the subtitle came to me first, long before we had a title for the book. That was what we sort of knew the subtitle was going to be, because um, it just seems like an important piece to bring in. And, and obviously, smashing the patriarchy feels like such an innocuous way in which women speak all the time about feminism. And so it just was really just uh, to focus on how is it that we can make it clear that, you know, this idea of smashing the patriarchy, it's, it's affecting women and men simultaneously. You know, it's all of us who are included in that us. It could be, you know, people could read it as just women, but I think it's all of us are being really heavily damaged by it. So that was really the more the idea of how do we go after something that feels like it's such the bedrock of feminism and really show how it's damaging all of us instead of just affecting women. <laughs> So are you saying with that that feminism really has become less about actually advancing women and more about, you know, the mission has just become about smashing patriarchy? Yeah, well, I mean, among other things. But yeah, I, don't, I think, um, you know, this was the interesting thing about my research was really just seeing how feminism has been an ideology from the beginning, uh, almost the very earliest days of it. And so as a result, that... Well, and part of that is because they're asking the wrong question from the very beginning. They're asking, how do we make women more like men? Because they saw the lives of men and thought, okay, they look easier and better. And there's no babies and fertility and all of these kinds of, you know, children to raise. And so um, that was, has been really the driving question about it. And so when you, you know, take a group of people and try to reorder altogether their whole human nature, you know, you're going to end up with some very serious problems. And you also have built into that question a kind of envy, um, which we see playing out all the time around us, you know, this dynamic where women want to be more like men, but they're also asking men to be more like women. And so there's this sort of weird schizophrenia going on. You know, we hate, we love you and we want to be like you, but we also hate you and want you to be different. So, um, yeah, I, I think that the battle between the sexes has, has done incredible disservice to us. And it's really been aggravated by this idea that the patriarchy is really the, the, the part of the problem um, or really is the problem. And, and it, that's really what's making women unhappy when in fact it, it's the exact opposite. I can't find it um, right here, but somewhere towards the front of the book, you mm -hmm. say that the, um, the feminist movement has really become about, you know, making, making women less feminine and making them more like men. And, and I like the way you put it, cheap knockoffs of men. Mm -hmm. Cheap yeah. knockoffs of men. Explain that just a little bit. Yeah. Well, I, you know, from the beginning, one of the the key pieces of the feminist movement has been this idea of free love, so that women can have sexual relationships the way they perceive men to have them, without consequence and without pregnancy and whatnot. And so that that's been sort of one of the main pieces that we see very early on in the feminist movement. Um, but as a result, that this isn't these are not the kind of men in which 
we should really want to be emulating. These are not good men. Um, and that's what feminism has been pushing us towards is to being more like bad men, you know, men that are motivated by power and control and sex, raw sexuality instead of sex in the know, city. Long, yeah. Long term committed relationships that, you know, raise a family and, and support uh, a nuclear family as the basic fundamental cell of, of civilization. That's clearly not what they're going after. It's the exact opposite, which is, you know, part of the effort is to destroy the nuclear family. I'm the, a few days ago on social media, I, I, I don't know exactly what it was that I was watching, but it was a video, um, I just a, a clip of what appeared to be either a college or um, high school gymnasium mm -hmm. um, where they're playing dodgeball, and it is guys versus girls. And um, one of the girls throws a ball. She throws it, you know, very well um, at one of these guys, but he easily dodges it and he returns fire and it's a missile and it nearly decapitates her. Mm -hmm. um, she is knocked right off of her feet onto her back. She appears to be unconscious. And I was <clears throat> reading the comments below it. There are people saying, you know, this is terrible. This is awful. But then there were those who are coming in and saying, but this is what you wanted. Mm -hmm. This is what you wanted. This is what you've been pushing for. Yeah. Yeah. I, at first, I thought we were witnessing the destruction of both sexes in a move towards a kind of unisex, where it's mm -hmm. neither male nor female. Right. But now I've come to believe that this isn't so, that we're instead seeing men annihilating women, erasing them all together and bizarrely that women are <laughs> are contributing to the destruction of other women I, am, am i right in seeing it this way no i i think you're you're exactly right it's really you know the 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 fulfillment of the ideology itself because in the 70s 70s 80s and you know moving forward after that the feminist movement really adopted this idea and this dream of getting rid of gender altogether um, and it's interesting because it, it didn't that idea didn't germinate there it started actually much earlier in, including the very earliest um, folks who articulated feminism one of them who was uh, Percy Shelley who was the, the poet um, he spoke about getting rid of gender altogether entirely. And this is in the early he, 1880s. Or he doesn't come out. He doesn't come out very positively in your book. <laughs> <laughs> well, he doesn't, he's not positive in any, you know, in any biography, but uh, yeah, he's, he's kind of a, he's definitely a cad and, um, you know, saw himself as benefiting from, from this free love movement that he was pushing, getting rid of, of matrimony and whatnot. So, Anyway, this this idea is an old one, but it's really, you know, gained some traction in the 70s and 80s. And, you know, how do we get rid of gender altogether? And you've got all these women's studies programs who are calling, you know, the female body and, and anything related to it a social construct and trying to erase those things um, and reinvent the human person in, in sort of the image that we want it to be in. Um, and this is, you know, the fulfillment of marching this forward, this idea that we can sort of be whomever we want to. Um, is what has led to this place of of the um, the trans culture and craze, um, but like anything, it always comes back to power, and this is what we're seeing. You know, these men have a lot more power um, physically, and so they're they're obviously going to overpower women. So it is, you know, it's it's kind of what you see with ideologies. It's sort of eating its own. Um, so all these women who are supporting it are are really supporting a this notion of a. a uh, you know, this transitional human nature and not really recognizing what reality is anymore and asking the rest of us to join in. And of course, reality is rearing its head with, uh, you know, that blast blast of the dodgeball, um, you know, coming at women at, at, in ways in which we we never expected because we just haven't faced it. Everyone's going to encounter pain in their life. The questions deal with the degree of one's pain and the source of one's pain and how we deal with our pain. In this course, I'm speaking very personally about my own pain and some of the lessons that I've learned in coping with pain, how we minister to people with pain, and what kind of perspective are we to have on the big questions that surround pain and human suffering? Why would you take a course like this? Well, presumably, if you haven't suffered in your own life, you will encounter people who do, and undoubtedly some of them 
are people who are very near and dear to you. I think it'd be very helpful for you to take a course like this in order to understand what they're experiencing and the way that you minister to people in those kinds of circumstances. So I'd love for you to take this course of mine. And I wanna tell you this, that when you subscribe to Tome, you get access not just to my course, but to more than a hundred other courses that are dealing with very practical issues and assisting you in living and in flourishing. So where can you get this course? Well, you can't get it at Amazon. You can't get it at Apple. You can't get it at Netflix. You can only get it at Tome. So I want you to go to tomeapp.com slash pain to learn more about my course. Let's get back to the podcast. It's interesting to witness that over the past, I don't know, 30, 40 years, uh, more perhaps that as women really post-industrial revolution in a big way, uh, women began entering into the workplace, but then it began to be just entering into male spaces altogether. Now we're seeing men go in the opposite direction. Men like, you know, Leah Thomas, so-called Leah Thomas, the, uh, the swimmer, going into female spaces. Again, yesterday I'm reading of a young man in high school, I believe, who ranked 174th in cross country or it may, did you see this as well? I think so. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's just dominating, story. dominating right. in, uh, in women's cross country, uh, a girl's cross country. And now he's, you know, he's, he's ranked fourth in the state or the country or something like this and moving, yeah. moving straight up. Um, where is all this going to end? I mean, if 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 the brakes aren't put on this, where where do you see this train going? Yeah, well, I think that's a great question. I think a lot of it depends on several things. One of which is just the the transitioning itself and the the medical aspect of it. I mean, it, gratefully, we're seeing brave women like Chloe Cole and others who have detransitioned, sort of fighting back and 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 speaking out against against it. Obviously, someone like Riley Gaines is doing an amazing job speaking out against it and you know making the point that if we don't stop this then it just ends up in sort of this third category of the the trans but they're going to be all men anyway um you know it's not like women are going to be able to compete in that sphere anyway so it just is creating um you know duplicate realities and of course you can imagine that splintering itself even further with further distinctions about whatever people want to transition into. Um, so yeah, I think it's, some of it is going to be just a, a, to see what happens on the, on the medical level, because I think it's going to be lawsuits that are going to stop a lot of the transitioning that's going on right now, that it's sort of the wild, wild west out there right now. And as more transitioners are, are detransitioning, that that's where we're going to see, start seeing lawsuits. And that's where things will, I think, calm down significantly once those multi, you know, million dollar suits are, um, siding with the detransitioners. Um, but yeah, I think culturally there's there's a huge fight because of the fact that you do have so many women who are supporting this, you know, very blindly and just th assuming that this is some sort of next step in the progress of humankind and not realizing the, the incredible damage that's being done to everybody with it. 30 years ago, I read the um, doctoral thesis, doctoral dissertation of Elaine Tyler May, Stanford University, and she wrote a, uh, it became a little book um, titled Adultery and Divorce in Post-Victorian America. It's, mm. it's not very big, but I was fascinated um, with her thesis and, and particularly, you know, on the left coast. I, to my knowledge, she's not a believer. Um, mm. And her argument was that marriage shifted from being about duty and responsibility to becoming about self-fulfillment. Everything became about self-fulfillment. And she tracks, you know, the divorce rate from say 1880 to 1920. And then with the industrial revolution, you know, women entering into, um, into the workforce in large numbers and then much larger numbers in, in, in World War II. And all of this in her argument was the destruction of marriage and thus the destruction mm -hmm. of the family. Was the feminist movement ever about anything other than self-fulfillment? I mean, did it ever really, yeah, you give a few nods in the book to, to the feminist movement, but, but not really, because at the end of the day, it feels like, um, 
the feminist movement was always about self-fulfillment, never really about any kind of altruistic motives. I mean, some of these founders of, of feminism, y you show them to be very broken people. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's a great question. And I've been asked that before um, about this, this specific issue. And I, I think this is the hard thing is we have been so really indoctrinated to believe that the feminist movement was, is, has been sort of this beneficent grandmother that's sort of guiding us and looking over us and trying to protect women and get us jobs and things like that. And, um, you know, it is kind of remarkable. You mentioned the industrial revolution and, um, you know, we, I, I think there's a big gap, you know, even before the industrial revolution of recognizing how much <clears throat> work that women did inside the home and men did inside the home as well. You know, that was sort of this, a, a totally much different economy happening. And so women are um, doing a, a lot of work in different ways and men are doing work in different ways. And that obviously changed dramatically with the industrial revolution. Um, but as a result, you know, you also see the ideology going on concurrently with that to sort of make women out into this vision of the oppressed. And this is one of the reasons why the feminist movement, I think, has had so much power, because we look back and see these, you know, women being seemingly being oppressed in ways that are, you know, make us very uncomfortable without really us thinking about like, okay, well, um, I pretty much push a button to do a load of laundry. Now I'm not, you know, nobody's worried about if I'm going to have food on my table this evening. You know, most women are, aren't not worried about these things. We have televisions and cars and, you know, all of these modern conveniences, um, that allow us to sort of look back at these women and see this kind of oppression. So I, I think that's, you know, we have to sort of frame the argument in, in historical terms that way. But part of that has been, you know, feminism has fed off of this notion of oppression for a very, very long time. And this belief that it's been freeing women. And um, this is what I, you know, the research of the book really looks at is how, what are the means through which they wanted to free women? Well, one of them, again, was this idea of free love um, and getting us to not have to worry about our fertility. And of course, that's, you know, the story of the 20th century, first with birth control, and then of course with abortion. Um, so to really get rid of fertility as, as any kind of what they would perceive as a problem was the main goal. Um, the occult was incredibly active throughout all of the feminist movement. Um, we see it now sort of out in the open, you know, no one's hiding the occult elements of, um, in the culture anymore. And then the third one, of course, is this idea of smashing the patriarchy where we just get rid of, um, any of the gifts that men have. And we sort of, again, sort of meld into this genderless world. So if you, when you start seeing this pattern emerge, you know, again, from the early 1800s, all the way up to what we're seeing today and its fulfillment in the trans movement, you know, it sort of begs the question, like, really, this is what was supposed to help women. And, uh, you know, one of the ideas that I've thought about recently, I'm, I'm sure you've seen Nancy um, Piercy's new book about toxic masculinity. I can't remember the title. I was just sent a copy. Yes. Yeah. Um, so she has one really interesting idea in it that's, that I've stewed on a lot. And that was, um, you know, this idea that men know the difference between a good man and a real man. Um, she, and she talks about sort of the world over people, men can sort of articulate the difference between that. Um, but on the flip side, I don't think we can articulate anymore the difference between a good woman and a real woman. Um, because we have made being a, a woman so much about power, um, that the women that we have as role models are powerful and they're in control and they have, they're wealthy, they have, you know, some kind of status, but you, it would be very, it would be very difficult to sort of ask a woman on the street, like, what's the difference between a good woman and a, and a real woman and come up with any kind of definitive answer, I think, because we've so muddied the waters in terms of telling women what they ought to be like versus what, you know, we, we really are. Um, so yeah, I, I, I don't, I'm not in any way convinced that there were, I, I think there were women individuals and pockets that were, that were longing to do good things and had the best of intentions. But I think because the, the, ideologically at its roots, the, the feminist movement has so um, disordered that it, it couldn't produce anything but what it's created, which is, you know, all this death, isolation, de depression, unhappiness for women, and, and certainly brokenness of the family. Well, and uh, based on, you know, just the reading, I mean, you've educated me quite a lot in uh, reading your book, and I don't disagree with a word in it. It is a fabulous book, and I strongly recommend that people are watching and uh, listening to us that they that they purchase it. Um, this uh, um, I, I find it quite fascinating because 
I get it that on the one hand, um, you you have been, as you say, indoctrinated. Women have been indoctrinated with this idea that feminism is, as you put it, this this grandmother who bequeaths something very special to you that you have to make sure you appreciate and you say repeatedly how much you appreciate it. But as I was discussing this with my wife, um, she would say, no, no, I don't appreciate any of it because Mm -hmm. it has led to the destruction, the annihilation of the unborn. It makes someone like me, meaning her, um, feel like somehow I'm really lesser a woman because I chose to stay at home, to homeschool my children, to dedicate myself um, to my family and to then find myself at one of my, meaning me, uh, at one of my, say, soirees where she's, you know, she's there with me and, you know, somebody comes up to her, you know, swirling, you know, uh, white wine in a glass and then says, you know, so what do you do? And um, she says, well, I'm, I'm an at-home mom. And this is, this is a woman, but this happens so many times. And she can feel the condescension, you know, mm-hmm. radiating towards her as though somehow she's, she's not achieved you know, really right. anything in her life. So I, I think, I think there are those who would, would certainly disagree with that, but it seems to me that it is about not just liberation. I would maybe, I would maybe put it in more raw terms. I would say it's about power. Isn't it really about power? Mm-hmm. No, absolutely. And this is the the idea. I mean, they've gotten us to think like Marxists. This is, you know, the, the, the training that they have given us to think about our terms and our, our lives in terms of power in terms of career and also in a, you know very narcissistic terms um, because they've they've led us to believe that our husbands and our children are, are obstacles to these ends that we should be striving instead of means to them so you know it's you can see very starkly in your wife's experience just this dichotomy of you know what's real versus what has been foisted upon us as this perception of good and yet it, it, you know it's not ultimately good again because of the destruction of the family um, you know, the huge numbers of, of abortions, which if looking at those numbers alone, it tells us that it's actually the, the deadliest ideology in all of human history that we have any kind of numbers for. Um, there's seven, something like 74 billion abortions worldwide annually. And there's, you know, people die roughly, we had in, in 2022, there were roughly um, 64 million people that died. So we are outstripping what everybody has died from all together collectively, um, you know, by 10 million, uh, the the number of abortions. So anyway, I probably said that very unclearly, but the point being, there's 10 million more abortions worldwide than there are people dying of everything else combined. Um, and this didn't happen, you know, overnight. This was absolutely part of the the agenda, again, because women have been told that their fertility is a liability and it's, you know, it's going to get in the way. And so we, we've got to sort of take care of it in order to take care of ourselves. Um, so that's the real tragedy is just how much we've, we've taken that on and believe it deeply. Well, looking at a microcosm of the, uh, the feminist movement, Me Too, Me Too initially, I think there were many people who saw this as having a, you know, a very good um, motivation here, an altruistic motivation. But yeah. then, um, you know, I, I do a fair amount of work in the UK and um, I'm addressing Islam and this kind of thing, debating Muslims in Hyde Park, um, Speaker's Corner in Hyde Park, and a major scandal. I'm talking to a friend of mine who um, uh, would appreciate your book, I think, very much, Melanie Phillips, uh, who writes for the Times of London. Melanie's Jewish, by the way, but she gets lots of death threats. And it was one of her colleagues who broke the Rotherham scandal. If you're familiar with the Rotherham scandal, Mm -hmm. where the sex gangs all over Britain and uh, all over Europe, um, Muslim sex gangs, the, the Times reported it, trying to be PC, reported initially as Asians. And then you had Sikhs mm-hmm. and the Chinese and the Koreans all coming out and say, whoa, 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 it was it's not, not us. Yeah. These were Muslim men, mostly Pakistani, a few Afghans. And at last count, at last count, according to the Independent, 19,000 white British adolescent girls have been systematically um, tra- uh, raped and trafficked all over Britain on, as the Times puts it, an industrial scale. It seems to me that if the feminist movement were really and truly altruistic, yeah. they would be addressing that. Instead, as you point out in your book, 
They're talking about the 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 phantom uh, racism of Meghan Markle, one of the most privileged individuals on the planet, rather than addressing. I mean, most of the people I talk to, I dare say most of the people listening to this podcast have never heard of the Rotherham scandal have never heard of it. And that's because it doesn't fit the PC narrative. What do you make of that? That we were the feminists for these girls. Why are they not stepping up for people like this? Yeah, no, I mean, I think you can see that across the board. There, you know, you're, we have all these studies that show that women are not happy either. I mean, that this is something you would think would miserable, be, you know, a huge thing that feminists could get behind is how do we help women become happier? And the, the, the reason is, is, is feminism itself. I mean, this is what's, it's creating incredible amounts of, of depression, um, suicide, substance abuse, all, all of these things are pointing to it. And it's again, because they're trying to give women a human nature that they just don't have and separate mm -hmm. us, us from the family and those things that ultimately, you know, serving others goes a long way into to, to making us happy. Um, so yeah, it's incredible. The, the amount of, um, really hypocrisy. I mean, you can see it all over the place of just what it is that they pick and choose to promote versus the things that are objectively horrific that they, you know, either are promoting or just ignoring. Well, um, I'll quote from your book. I tweeted this quotation. On top of everything else, women are not happy, says Carrie Gress. A uh, dramatic 2009 study issued by the National Bureau of Economic Research revealed that women are not growing happier as feminist ideals are embraced. In fact, the opposite is true. In the 1970s, women rated their overall life satisfaction higher than did men, but it has been on a steady decline ever since. And then you add this, which I find fascinating. The study revealed that women of all education groups have become less happy over time with declines in happiness having been steepest among those with some college. When I, when I tweeted this, a woman replied <clears throat> somewhat sarcastically. She said, I've been thinking about writing a book about how college or university destroyed <laughs> my life. Yeah. Um, yeah. Build on this just a bit for yeah. me. Explain this. Yeah. What's going on with this? What's the connection between education and unhappiness? Yeah, no, I think that's a great question. I mean, part of the the what's happening <laughs> is that the women that are educated, you know, I was one of these women. You you have this sense from the feminist movement. You have it from, and it's coming from everywhere. It's coming from, you know, Oprah. It's coming from magazines. It's coming from, and now, of course, all over social media, just this pressure that you have to be a certain kind of woman. You've got to be ambitious. You've got to be successful. You have to be articulate, all, all of these things. And they tell us this is sort of like the track that we have to, to, to follow. And education is really the key to getting the jobs that we want and the, the kind of future that we want. And it's, it's laid out very subtly, but it's very clear. There's no, there's no like off ramp. There's no alternatives to this. This is just what it is that we're told over and over again, oftentimes even in our own institutions too, um, that, you know, private institutions with, with kind of some kind of faith base, this is also being promoted very, very, um, aggressively. Um, and so what happens is, you know, so many of us end up in this place where we're like, I, I did all these things. I did all the things they told me I should do. Um, you know, gratefully in my case, I figured it out before I, you know, was too old to have children. But so many women that I have met have find are finding it out after the fact when they, you know, they're 60, 70 years old, their parents have died, they're they don't um they, maybe they didn't have siblings or they have one. Um, but they don't have children, they don't have a husband, and they're saying, This was not the life that I was promised. This is not at all what I was was looking for. Um, so this is the the hard thing is that we the, the culture has spent so much time focusing us on our careers that we get focused on the education and then we think, you know, somehow it's a bad thing if I interrupt that by getting married or if I get a you know, it's we're told to get the degree before we have the husband, um, certainly have the the job in place or loans paid for, you know, all these kinds of things before we have children. So all of those things that are naturally going to lead us to a kind of happiness, especially in our older age, um, we're, we're putting off or, you know, choosing other things instead of them, because this is, again, what we're told over and over again is really how we need to live our lives. A young woman who works for me, um, I am walking by and I see on her giant, you know, iMac or whatever it is that she has, that she's looking at the Facebook page of another young woman who is her rival 
for the affections of a young man. And she's looking at her face, you know, this, this young woman's Facebook page. And mm -hmm. I said, listen, get off of there. It's going to depress you. And that is because <clears throat> you have to understand that her Facebook page it's not reality. It's, it's pictures of her, you know, and standing in, you know, in front of Iguazu Falls in South America and the, uh, you know, the Eiffel Tower and with beautiful people. I mean, it is, it is the, the very best of all of her life. And it has established for you a kind of standard that's mm -hmm. unreachable. Do you think social media, I guess, particularly with young, young people, yeah, young women, do you think it plays a role in this depression that you're speaking of in here? Yeah. No, I think you're exactly right. I think, um, you know, Abigail Schreier lays it out very, very clearly in her book, Irreparable Damage, which is about gender dysphoria among young girls. And, you know, she says this was non-existent before the smartphone. And, um, you know, it started coming on strong with the uh, the arrival of the smartphone. And therefore, um, you've got all these young girls who are constantly comparing themselves to others. Um, you know, it just exacerbates everything, all of the the female weaknesses. Um, and we're not really seeing anything in its place because, of course, the culture isn't saying, you know, you should actually become you. There, there's something good about being good. There's something good about being vir virtuous. Instead, it's so focused, again, on power and appearances and ambition, you know, all of these things that I, I think make women feel incredibly insecure about you know, just being a, a good person and and loving others and giving of themselves in, in other ways. You know, none of that messaging is is getting across. So, absolutely, I think that's um, you know the hardest part is it makes everything so superficial and um, and also it really strips us of you know, the richness of relationships that I think women really thrive off of. Are we we love rich, rich relationships? We love being in connection with people. You know, we're, we're we can dial into people very easily. This is one of our uh, you know, the greatest gifts that women have, obviously men have it to a degree, but this is, you know, women thrive off of this and that's, you know, sort of s snips away at that, those kinds of virtues because it doesn't encourage them in any way. And it just, you know, leads us to this very superficial, um, you know, goal of looking good instead of actually being good. <laughs> You um, are talking about, and again, we were talking about the subtitles to your book, which says how smashing the patriarchy has destroyed us. And <clears throat> you were just pointing out how it's not just feminism transforming women, but it's transformed men. Yeah. Are, are women satisfied with the men that they're getting, with the kind of men that I think it's Camille Paglia who said that we've, we, we as women got what we wanted and we're now left with this kind of Frankensteinian creation of a man that we don't want. And I came across this very interesting article that was written about, I don't know, 20 years ago. It's a South African author, but she's, she's writing from Europe. And she says this, which I think is very interesting. She's talking about the rise of the Metro man, you know, back in the nineties and early two thousands. And she says this faced with this new crop of male gourmet cooks who read self-help books. I find myself yearning for the Marlboro cowboy forever riding alone into the sunset. He didn't take up bathroom shelf space with his sunblock PF 30 body lotions, waxing creams, and hair gels. He didn't, leave his boots in my closet since he wore them while he was riding off into the said sunset. <laughs> Do you think women are satisfied with the kind of men they're getting? Yeah. I mean, I think that's a whole other problem. Women are obviously very attracted and drawn to men who are confident and, you know, men have been undermined, not just with their, you know, bathroom shelf products, but also just psychologically in terms of not really knowing how to be men, not being, really launched into manhood by their, their fathers, you know, the, there's just this incredible amount of young men and even older men. I know plenty of them who are, you know, seeming, you can look at them and still say, you know, you might be 60, 65 years old, but psychologically, I think you're still about 15 um, because there's no sense of uh, responsibility, uh, you know, authority, um, protection, you know, all of those kinds of things that, that you would expect and hope to find in, in, you know, fathers, grandfathers, great grandfathers. And instead it's this very, you know, adolescent sort of self-regard and narcissism as well. So no, absolutely. It's gone both ways is it, it's it led men to not be men. It's also led men to not want to engage with women, um, even on, on a healthy level, you know, it's, a, and, and, you know, if you enter into, or 
you know, introduce the idea of feminism into this discussion, that there's nothing that will shut a man down more quickly than that conversation, because of course he knows he's not going to win it. <laughs> there's no way he can come out the winner on that kind of a conversation. So, yeah, I, I think that on so many different levels, the the damage is just, it's, you know, the wreckage is, is really everywhere. And that doesn't even get into, you know, the, the bad men who are benefiting from this, you know, sort of the the playboys that um, started off with the model of Hugh Hefner and, you know, just evolved from there with, that are, you know, happy to use the, the services of abortion clinics and things like that to sort of keep their lifestyle, you know, carefree. I've been speaking on this podcast about something that I, I call generational wisdom. And what I mean by that, Carrie, is this idea that there's a kind of wisdom that isn't acquired in a single generation. It's handed down. And the you're not a Southerner, are you, Carrie? I'm not. No. Okay. Well, then just, yeah. just you, you won't know anything about my example. But the example I was using was Southern biscuits, which are kind of disappearing. And it is because you will hear women say that they're very hard to make. And so I go online and I, I find this woman by the name of Brenda Gant, who's in her 70s, I think. And she has these little videos. She's just as country as she can be. She has loads of um, followers. And she's just teaching young women how to make all kinds of things. But one of them is biscuits. And she will make She'll make frequent references to her mother, to her grandmother, and say, this is the way she did this, and this is the way she did this. And she teaches you lots of little tricks that you would never get out of a recipe book. You just never get it. And it dawned on me in watching her that this is true of, you know, it's true of skills, it's, it's, it's tr but it's true of life skills. It's true of being a woman. It's true of being a man. It's true of being a mother. It's true of being a, a father. All of those kinds of things. Do you see any connection between the feminist movement, the destruction of the family, the destruction of marriage, the destruction of femininity, masculinity, as being connected to this, you know, as, as, as the nuclear family has become so spread out. Yeah, yeah. That there's this, there's this lack of, of wisdom being handed down generationally as it once was. Yeah, no, I think that's an incredible point. And I think that, you know, feminism, what it did was it really denigrated all of those kinds of things, those family relationships or even the role of the family altogether. And so it's, you know, this is one of actually been a real cornerstone stone of my work is this idea of everything about homemaking is popular again. You know, like you said, the biscuits and, and knitting and gardening, you know, all of these things. But the word homemaker itself is not popular. Um, people still think of it as- Interesting. As so people still, ha they have this deep yearning for these things. And of course, COVID just, you know, exacerbated that um, with people being home. Um, but they don't know how to categorize it because it's not supposed to fit in the narrative at all. And, um, you know, this is, I've written several books now of, under the title Theology of Home, um, where we're really trying to get at what does it mean to be um, a home? What is it, what is a home supposed to do? And, uh, you know, fundamentally on a theological level, the home is meant to be a foretaste of heaven. It's supposed to help, not only that, but it's also supposed to help those around us get to heaven. Um, you know, that this is, it, it, it's, a real a foreshadowing of the love that God has for us embedded in the family. And um, we can obviously also see how it could be a foretaste of hell as well. You can imagine, you know, broken homes that they have that, that capacity to show us really, you know, the diabolical. Um, so anyway, I, I think, um, you know, just the reaction we've had to these books, it's been incredibly heartening because I think people are hungry for this. They want something deeper. They want to get back and tap into this kind of wisdom um, that, that we know existed at some point, but we don't get at our fingertips. And I think even just the hunger that women have for uh, mentors um, is, is, you know, there's a whole industry sort of booming off of that because women just didn't have the, you know, the mothers that taught them how to make a chicken or, to, you know, like you said, the biscuits or, or even a pie crust. Um, so they, these are things that we, we love to be able to make because there's a, just this implicit joy in being able to feed people delicious food and not only the food, but also the conversation and the, you know, the conviviality and, and the connection that comes from, from serving a, a beautiful and, and delicious meal. So, yeah, I think these are huge issues that um, feminism has completely, you know, cordoned us away from. And some of it is sort of seeping back into the culture just because we have a, a desire and, you know, deep hunger for these things. Well, um, I think there's an, there's a corollary here, and that's an additional lie that 
people have subtly bought into that Google is the replacement for generational mm -hmm. wisdom. You just, you, you don't, you don't need your grandmother anymore. You don't need your mother. Right. You, you just go to Google or YouTube and you can find yeah. what you want there. Yeah. I want to hit, um, on an issue that you, you touched on just a, a few minutes ago, and that is the occult. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that really surprised me in reading your book and in talking to you just, uh, just briefly is the connection between feminism from its, from its very beginning. It yeah. isn't, I, you're making the argument that feminism wasn't hijacked and, mm -hmm. you know, and turned into the occult, but rather it was tied into the occult yeah. from the very beginning. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, I, you know, and this goes back to Percy Shelley, whom I mentioned previously, you know, the eight poet, English poet, he died, in, I think, in 1829, maybe. No, he was 29 years old. Maybe he died before that, probably around 1818. But um, Shelley himself was, I, I think you can actually say he's the first one to really articulate the feminist position. He came up with this idea of an independent woman um, in this character named Sithna. So Shelley's married to Mary Shelley. She's writing about Frankenstein, you know, she published, is publishing that. And he's publishing a book about um, Sithna, um, who's the first independent woman. She didn't have a husband. She had no children. Um, her only connection was really to Satan himself. Um, so he's fascinated by the occult and, you know, really motivated by it. But he's also intrigued by this idea of how do we reread Genesis 3? Um, how do we make Eve the heroine instead of showing Eve to be, you know, the, the conduit through which Adam and Eve fall? And um, so this is, you know, part of his his project is this sort of diabolical restructuring of Eve, saying that the serpent really gave her an opportunity. And based you know, on his reading of Milton, exactly. So she's yeah. Eve has Paradise this kind lost. of wisdom. yeah, she's got this kind of wisdom that we need to tap into. And um, you know, this was just an idea that sort of took hold in the 1800s, and you see it. You know, coming through this, this the work called Theosophy, which was a kind of esoteric um, blending of all kinds of new, well, we wouldn't call it new agey then, but um, voodoo and, you know, all kinds of, of cult activity going on in the 1800s by a, a Russian noble. And this also gets picked up by Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who was very anti-Christian. Um, she was raised a Calvinist and, and rejected her faith and was actually actively working against Christianity. Um, she wrote a book called The Women's Bible. And, uh, you know, it sort of reads like an ad, an angry adolescent who, you know, she just goes through and any, I mean, anytime a woman is mentioned, she just can't leave it alone. She's got to have her commentary about how oppressed she is and how awful it is and whatnot. Um, so anyway, it was very much a, a, a thing in the 1800s. Um, from you know Shelley's influence, but you also have this huge, um, uh, this you know the Second Great Awakening going on in the United States. But behind that are seances and mediums, and um, so Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony were very involved with mediums and uh, with women who would you know ha hold seances for them and try and help them you know, figure out where, what, what they should do and the directions in which they should go. And part of that was even the Seneca Falls conference that, that Elizabeth Cady Stanton used, which, you know, the story goes, that was what really kicked off the, the women's movement. Um, and in fact, she got the idea for it at what she calls her spirit table, where um, the spirits were, were knocking and informing her of, you know, how she ought to approach this problem. So yeah, it's, it was really astounding to dig into all of this and see just how deep the occult was embedded in the movement from, you know, the very, it's very inception. Well, you say this, um, on page 22, Wicca or witchcraft has more adherence in the United States than there are members of the Presbyterian church USA. Now I would say there's not much difference between, you know, Wicca and the PC USA. I, yeah. <laughs> I, I say I'm a Calvinist and, uh, as you know, so I, I look at the PC USA and I go, yeah, okay, come on. I mean, these guys really don't, they don't really have any theology, but that's actually quite startling. Either that means there are a lot of wicked people or the PCUSA is what I think it is, which means they really don't have any, many members. I mean, tell us, tell right. us what's going on with right. this. This is quite yeah. shocking. You make mention of Madonna. I'd forgotten about this, but her 2012 Super Bowl performance, which was quite demonic. Yeah. And this was probably in the process of being published before it happened. But then you had Sam Smith. Yes. Yeah. Doing something. What, or, excuse me. Is his name Sam Smith? Is that that that's his that's his name? That's right. 
Yeah, that's right. Sam Smith doing something. Was that at the Super Bowl? Where where was that? Where he was doing that blood drenched, you know, Um, anyway. It was one of the award Uh, uh, ceremonies, I thought. That's right. You're right. It was uh, it was the Grammys or something like Mm -hmm. that where she was where where he was doing this. And it was it's openly demonic, you know, kind of stuff. And then you have somebody like Beyonce, you know, making uh, uh, references to her demon spirit. Yeah. This is yeah. jarring to see a culture go full on embrace of mm-hmm. the satanic. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I was having a very interesting conversation with Oxford University professor um, John Lennox, who's a, a longtime friend of mine and um, kind of the C.S. Lewis um, of our time. But w- together we've been addressing atheism, academic mm-hmm. atheism for about, I guess, about 16, 17 years now. And we were discussing how this has morphed into something that isn't really a belief in no spirit whatsoever, but it has morphed into a belief in, you know, it's like G.K. Chesterton says, it's not that you won't believe anything when you deny there is no God. You will believe anything. You'll believe everything. Uh, what, what, What is this connection? What's going on here that feminism has this connection with the occult? Yeah. Well, this again goes back to Katie Stanton. And, um, you know, one of the things that happened with the with the mediums in this um, second great awakening is that women realized they actually didn't need a pastor anymore. They didn't need a priest. They didn't need a man to mediate between them and God anymore. When you have these spirits who will knock on a table and tell you what you ought to do or what, you know, people from beyond the grave are, are suggesting um, it can just be done through women. And this was, you know, a radical new idea to at, at that era. And um, so you see this sort of happening over and over again. And I think throughout history, you can see the, a rise in, in paganism and rich, witchcraft, certainly when Christianity is weak, but it's also a means through which women feel powerful. Um, and so this is what the feminist movement is really you know, riding on this wave of the the occult because it gives women this this false sense of power that they can control things on on their own instead of in any way being embedded into some sort of church community um, that is also being led by men, um, which is obviously you know part of their problem um, per, as they perceive it. So yeah, it's just one of those things that again in the sixties and seventies, there was just this incredible explosion, partially because we know what happens with the, the culture, but also because it was just seemed like a very attractive way for women to be powerful and to not need men, um, was through these, uh, you know, ideas of, of witchcraft. There were also the rise in the population of the, this demon named Lilith, um, who, you know, Lilith fair was, a, a festival of, of musicians. Um, and she's known as this sort of, um, female, female demon, but also someone who rejected Adam. Again, you go back to Genesis and this rejection of biblical principles. So yeah, it's just exploded. And, uh, it, it really, uh, you know, I could write a whole book just on this topic and I, I didn't want to do that because I, I really wanted people to grapple with the ideas and, and see kind of the logical and ideological thread of it. Um, but the, the occult piece is just overwhelming and, you know, not at all hidden and very much, you know, even one of the books in the seventies, the, the sisterhood is powerful. That was edited by Robin Morgan actually had spells in the back of it, sort of everyday use kinds of spells in the back of this sort of feminist, um, anthology. Um, so it's, it's been out in the open, I think from, from the beginning and just fits into that narrative of, women are, are important and men are not. And, um, you know, this is how they sort of feed it by all of this brokenness of that, that is rendered because of the occult. That, that's an interesting statement. Um, this idea that it's not about equality, um, that women are important and men are not, uh, develop yeah. that just a bit. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of what you see that, you know, I think this is somewhat stated, um, very subtle ways, but it becomes much more out in the open kind of argument in the seventies. And even this, there was this group called scum. Um, I can't remember exactly what the acronym was for, but something about killing men. Um, and you hear it, you know, sort sounds of like a out. great name for a group like that. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It's perfect. Um, but you hear it leaked out, you know, by other people in the culture about, you know, wanting to get rid of all men. And, um, you know, it's interesting, too, that we see so many women sort of leaving the feminist movement when they have sons because they just don't know what to do with this affection that they have for a, a male because they've been taught over and over again. You know, men are oppressors. Men are bad. Men are, you know 
toxic and and need to be um, thwarted. And so, yeah, it's it's definitely another one of those threads that you know doesn't make it to the surface all that often. But it's if you look for it, it's certainly there um, because it's just so you know in so many respects just such a vile concept of how do we how do we just get rid of men because of course they it's truly the belief that women are better than men women are sort of the pinnacle of um relationships that the lesbian relationship is one that ought to be privileged in their belief because you there's no serving a man in that relationship and there's also also no risk of of pregnancy um so that's really why it's idolized on on so many levels by feminism in uh we've got just a few minutes left uh here carrie uh, have you seen the statue of ruth that was supposed to be uh you know uh honoring ruth bader ginsburg this demonic statue that was done by an indian artist it is startlingly demonic wow. it is shows um you know what is supposed to be her face but with horns and then medusa like you know circles wow. kind of coming out of the wow. side of her head and then wrapping around her and then her feet become like snakes oh. and it's very large it's i want to say it's maybe eight or ten feet and the artist who did it is an indian artist that is to say from india and um it says that this is you know a blending of various gods and goddesses and deities and it's um the yeah. idolized version of a of a woman but it's but it's to your point it is absolutely demonic this yeah. particular characterization of things you know your book has kind of confirmed me in my opinion <laughs> that all of these revolts against civilization are at bottom at first and foremost the revolts against god yeah. Would you agree with that? That oh, feminism no, is that? Yeah, no, absolutely. It's really this idealization of the the female and this this effort to live without God and without, you know, the Ten Commandments. I mean, that's this is really when it came about was Mary Wollstonecraft and other, you know, um enlightenment and romantic th thinkers didn't know how to get, you know, have any moral statu statutes anymore. They wanted to get rid of the the Ten Commandments. And so they sort of came up with all of these other concepts that they thought could, could take its place. And, you know, you just see this sort of spinning out of control, even in the last 10 or 15 years, how much the, you know, the, the yardstick keeps getting moved about what's good and what's bad and, you know, redetermined because we don't have any, anything like the 10 commandments to sort of be a stopgap and a, a way to, in which we need to, you know, order our lives around that. So yeah, absolutely. It's, it's fundamentally came from, from that era when, you know, people were trying to get rid of God and it's a response to try and move forward without him. And, um, you know, we know well what happens when, people try to live without God. And we're certainly seeing and feeling acutely the, the effects of that. Well, Carrie, it has been a pleasure to have you on the podcast uh, today. And again, I just want to tell people, um, I, I found this book fascinating. My wife uh, devoured it before I did. As soon as it came in, uh, she, she read it and uh, keeps asking me, so what's your opinion? What's your opinion? I'm like, well, give me a minute. Let me, let me, let me read it. But I've enjoyed it. Uh, immensely, and you delve into some extremely important, extremely important issues. And I think your next book should be that connection with the occult, because mm -hmm. I, you've kind of whetted our appetite with this, but I, I think that there's a, obviously a much deeper connection here that's, that's kind of mind blowing and uh, sort of frightening at the same time. Yeah. Well, and I have dug into it deeper in a previous book, actually, my book called The Anti-Mary Exposed, which really goes into the theological issues much more dramatically because, you know, holding up the Virgin Mary as a model of womanhood and really recognizing, you know, we haven't just listed a little bit in the culture, but we are actually acting in a way that's diametrically opposed to the mother of God. Um, the mother of Christ. So anyway, yeah, it's, it's a, a fascinating topic and um, I, I think there is a lot to it and, and, you know, maybe there'll be more, but it's such a hard thing to research <laughs> that uh, well, I can't imagine doing it anytime soon, but um, yeah, it's, it's, there's definitely a need for it. People need to know this stuff. There's a great need to affirm motherhood. There's a great need to affirm real um, femininity and somewhere in the culture, 
women began to see, I don't know when, I, I'm, I'm not exactly sure where, maybe, maybe you are, I'm not, I'm not sure what the Rubicon, where the Rubicon was, but women went from seeing their femininity as their strength yeah. to seeing it as their liability and that everything mm -hmm. feminine must be suppressed. And as you say, you create in the end, a kind of knockoff cheap version of masculinity, just as we're seeing, you know, men creating uh, yeah, to say cheap is is maybe to 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 elevate it more than it deserves. Yeah. Uh, knockoffs of women. So yeah. clearly, God has created two lanes, and uh, as those lines have been uh, have been blurred, we're seeing the destruction of the family. We're seeing the destruction of the entire culture. Carrie, it's been great to have you with us. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. It's been my pleasure.